Well, folks, I got to begin this morning with an unpleasant task. In my goal, I can't say since I started preaching because I can see a different attitude in myself in my younger years. But in my older years, my goal in preaching has been to share the Word of God with all of you, with anyone that I have opportunity to teach, and to together learn the truth. I have no feeling that I have all the truth. I'm looking for it. I'm searching for it. I'm digging and I'm doing everything I can to find in God's Word God's intentions. I want us to do that together. And Wednesday night, we had a class, and I got a little vociferous, you might say. My wife and my mother-in-law, mom, just plainly told me I was right on the cusp of being rude. And that is the last thing in the world I want. I, I don't want to come across that way. I don't want to hurt anybody or cause anyone to not speak out in class. And that comment was made that that's why I don't speak up in class. And I don't want to be the cause of that. And I apologize. I'm going to do my level best to teach with great patience and wisdom if I can find it somewhere. <laughs> if I can say what I need to say, I'm going to do it as kindly and as patiently as possible. And uh, I, Marge, I talked to Marge this morning because she was the one I got a little bit testy with. And she said she did not take it that way. Good. And I'm, I'm glad she didn't. <laughs> but... I'm apologizing anyway because I don't need to, like my grandma said to me one time, many times, you better get down off your high horse. Well, I, I don't want to be on that high horse. So, I'm, I'm initiating a new something today. Years ago. Years ago, what? No, no, this is far from the olive branch. Years ago, every time I misbehaved, my dad would send me out to get my own switch. And uh, if I came back with one that was too small, he'd send me out again. If I came back with one that was too big and not limber enough to wrap around my legs, he'd send me out again. This is the rod of correction. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you a little story about this. It's an age-old legend that I just started this morning. <laughs> I have a nephew named Aaron. And my dad was famous for sending you out to get your own switch. And his grandson, Aaron, as the story goes, had misbehaved. And dad sent him out to get a switch. Well, my father-in-law, Bud, this was at a family gathering, so the story goes, it was at a family gathering, and my father-in-law took the stick when he found it, and he hid it so that my dad couldn't do the job with it. So this is Aaron's rod that Bud hid, <laughs> just so you know what it is. Now, this is Marge's stick. <laughs> Until I do it to somebody else and she has to hand pass the rod to someone else. So this belongs to you, Marge. Don't hesitate to use it, dear. This teaching. I don't know why anybody would want to do it because... We're told, 
Be not many of you teachers, for therein lies a heavier judgment. I worry about teaching the wrong thing. That's why I don't hesitate to tell me I'm wrong. I, I, will, I might get mad and bite your head off, but I will apologize later. <laughs> I, I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to be wrong. I don't care about appearing wrong. I just don't want to be wrong. Okay? So don't hesitate. I want us to turn this morning to the reading that we had. You know, Jake didn't have much time to look that over, and I apologize for that. That's my fault. In this story of Belshazzar, you can't really read the story of Belshazzar without reading the story of his grandfather. Not his father, but his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was very possibly the greatest king, aside from Solomon and the Lord Jesus, that ever reigned on this earth. He was one of the most brilliant builders, one of the most unbelievable leaders. He set up a system of government that, that is just was the hallmark for many nations around the world. And in his doing all of this, he realized how good he was. He realized how magnificent he was. And so there was a dream sent to him, a dream of a big tree. And the tree was huge and it covered the whole earth and it fed the whole earth and it shaded the whole earth. I mean, this was a magnificent tree. And then some angelic watchers came and shouted out, cut down the tree and strip its fruit and spread its foliage. And this just worried him, worried him and he wanted to know what it meant. So he called all of his diviners and none of them could tell what it meant and he went back to Daniel who had explained a dream to him before and Daniel told him what it meant and this is what Daniel said in verse 24 of chapter 4 of Daniel this is the interpretation O king and this is the decree of the most high which has come upon my lord the king now understand Daniel had been taken by Nebuchadnezzar when he was a boy taken to Babylon and raised and, te- and taught all of the Babylonian ways. <coughs> Daniel remained faithful to God all through all of that. And because of Daniel's faithfulness, he was placed by God in the palace of the king. He's in a place now to tell the king what he needs to hear. This, O king, is the decree of the Most High which has come upon my lord the king that you will be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field and you will be given grass to eat like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. And in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree. Your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Daniel really liked Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was good to him. Nebuchadnezzar really had been pretty good to the Jewish people that had been taken into Babylon or Yes, Babylonian captivity. He says, break away now from your sins by doing righteousness. Even kings of the earth are held to a standard. And this standard is something that God spoke to Moses or uh, Abraham about in Genesis chapter 15. Abraham was promised that land. The land of Canaan. But God said to Abraham, I can't give it to you right now because the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. I'd like for you to picture now, if you can, the terms that the Bible uses to speak of things like this. Bowls collect sins. 
And the sins pile up in those bowls until they reach the lip of the bowl. And when they flow over, they're no longer sins. But they are wrath. And that's where we come up with, in the very end of the Bible, the terms, bowls of wrath. These are the sins that have been collecting for centuries or for decades or maybe for minutes. It doesn't, we don't have the key to that. Quite often it's much longer than we want to see it. But those sins pile up and when they run over the edge, that's when payment is due. That's when payment comes. And it's never what went in. It's always more. You sow to the wind and you reap a whirlwind, God says. So what comes out is way worse than what goes in. So what he's saying to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, is I want you to break away, Daniel's saying this, because he likes him. I want you to break away from your sins now by doing righteousness, by uh, showing kindness to the poor. Let me read that again. Uh, From your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. God's given you a chance. Here's what you need to do. In order to measure up, in order to be measured and found capable, found not wanting, I want you to do these things that I'm telling you and you will measure up to what God wants. So it says all this in verse 28 happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Daniel gave him his answer. Everything's fine, right? Twelve months later, He was walking on the roof of his royal palace in Babylon a year later. And the king reflected. And he said, is this not Babylon the Great? Trust me, folks, this place was great. Uh, Read about this place. It was 60 miles around the city. And the walls were 350 feet tall. Can you imagine that? 350 feet tall at the towers. It was 450 feet tall. There, is there a 45-story building in Idaho? Not one anywhere in this state. I don't think there's one in Spokane, is there? Not 45 stories. That's 450 feet tall. That's the towers that were on the, the walls of the city of Babylon. 87 feet tall wide at the top. They had chariot races on the walls of Babylon. I don't know how wide they were at the base of those walls, but they went 30-some feet below ground. This was an impenetrable city. You couldn't get in. God said, if an army can't get in, then I'll attack you. I'll take you down. And it's kind of interesting that in the historical picture of Babylon, there's a seven-year period where they don't register a king. He's just not there. Evidently, he was in the loony bin or out in the pasture eating grass like a cow, like it says. But one day, one day he came to his senses, and here's what it said. It says, while the word was still in the king's mouth, uh, he said, let me read the rest of 30. Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal uh, residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? You think it's all about him? (laughs) While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it has been declared sovereignty has been removed from you. Sovereignty means the right to command. It means the one that answers to no one. That's been stripped from you and you will be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field and it goes on talking about what's going to happen to him. Immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled 
And he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Verse 34, but at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. He does according to His will in the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off His hand. I want you to think about that. I was in the grocery store the other day. It was about a three or four year old little boy. And he was just making himself known. And his mother was trying to get him to do something. And every time she would reach for him, he would go warding off her hand. And this passage comes to mind when I see something like that. There is no king, no president, no body on this earth who has the ability, the power, to ward off God's hand. Amen. So when he says this, this is something we need to recognize that even the mightiest of human mighty cannot ward off God's hand. Or say to him, what have you done? Boy, I tell you, I heard that a bunch growing up. And my grandma was the chiefest of those saying that because she watched me like a hawk. At that time, my reason returned to me. And my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. And my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. You know what they were doing the day before yesterday? They were running from this guy. Don't, I don't even want to be seen with him. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty, and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. I've seen way too much pride in the pulpits of our churches. I've seen way too much arrogance. I don't want to be a part of that, folks. So if you see it, you tell me. I'll do my level best to correct it. Now, one thing I'm going to say is I don't apologize for what I said yet because I think it's right. If I find it to be wrong, I'll apologize for that too. But we need to seek the truth together. We need to seek the measurement that really counts. You know, Nebuchadnezzar had a system of measurement that is still used in the world today. A system of measuring and weights that is seriously counted on by nations everywhere in this world. And everything is sold, bought, by using those standards of measure and weight. So when we get over to chapter 5, and this young whoopersnapper upstart Belshazzar who didn't do a thing to build anything but the kingdom dissipated during his reign, when he starts showing his disrespect for the God that Nebuchadnezzar said, I praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven. When he started showing that disrespect, then this hand, comes out of nowhere and starts writing on the wall. Thus we have that statement, the handwriting on the wall. 
I don't know of anybody who doesn't know. Well, maybe there are people that don't know what that means. But that all my growing up years, that was a statement everybody recognized. I've seen the handwriting on the wall. You know what that means. <laughs> that has definite meanings that your time is up, dude, if you don't do some changing. So when we read this about Belshazzar, I want you to think about it a minute. In verse 25 of chapter 5, the hand was sent and this inscription was written out. Now, this is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, you farsen. Huh. That's Persian to me, but it says this is the interpretation of the message. Mene, God has numbered, measured your kingdom and put an end to it. Just that simple. It's not a tree cut down now where the stump is saved. This time, there's not going to be a remnant of it. This time, it's going to pass to another people. And they're going to have a chance to do something with it. But I want you to stop and think about something. Who is it that has been ruling since the beginning of time? You might go back through the different kings. And show the different dynasties of the different nations that have been on the face of the earth. But I want to point something out to you. That a thousand years before Moses. All of the laws that we find in the Levitical laws. Except for the religious ones. But all the laws that had anything to do with people, with people uh, and governing people, all of those laws were found in the code of Hammurabi. The king that was way, way, way before this one here in Babylon. You can find almost word for word the laws about boundaries, about weights and measures, about fairness, about saving the, the corners of your crops, about all of those things that had to do with people taking care of people. All of those things are found in a law that preceded Moses by a thousand years. Does that kind of shock you? It's the truth. You go back and you look at it and you begin to understand that the law of Moses was not the first law. There was law from the very beginning. As a matter of fact, I want you to turn over to the book of Galatians and let's read something there. I wanted to read this the other day and I noticed that I got partway through it and didn't, didn't finish the thought. So today you get, what was it, Paul Harvey? Rest of the story. When Paul is dealing with the differences between the deeds of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit, you've got, oh, I, keep, I keep coming back to this, but it's really important for us to understand. There's only one source of Spirit. Hebrews tells us that we have, our God is the Father of Spirits. Every Spirit that exists comes from God. It's kind of like, you ever had a sourdough, a sourdough mix? One time, Mom made some pancakes. Those were the best pancakes I had ever had in my entire life. And I asked her where it came from, and she said that that mix was, how old was it, 150 years old? 150 years, I'm eating 150-year-old pancakes here. Because the essence of that was started, and it might have been older than that, but somebody way, way back there started this, and then every once in a while a piece of that was taken, and it fermented the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. But there were remnants in that pancake that I ate of 150-year-old pancakes. That's about the closest I can come to understanding how we all, every one of us, have a piece of God. That God, when we're created, there's a, there's a body of flesh 
that is created by this process that God put in motion when he created the world. And when every one of us are born, there's a little bit of spirit that God puts in that body that is part of God. That's why we're so special in this creation. It's why we're different from the bugs. It's why we're different from the beasts of the field. It's why we rise to a higher standard than the rest. Because we are made in God's image. We are part of that spirit. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mel. Now I'm telling you, we have to understand the greatness of humanity. But we're not greater than our creator. I don't understand people who want to equate. I had a, <laughs> I had a woman one time that jumped all over me for stepping on a bug. She says, who made you better than the bug? I, I don't even know how to respond to that. I don't even know what to say to an idiot. What makes me better? If, if you had ever opened your Bible to chapter 2 of Genesis, you'd know what makes me met better than a bug or a camel. I don't know where that came from. But... <laughs> All of the rest of it. I know what makes me better. But I also know what makes me have to rise to a higher standard, to a better measurement, a more distinct calling. You know, as you read this passage, and I, I want to get to it this time. I don't want to forget about it. Paul is dealing with how we are led by the Spirit. But understand that people that go the other way, they're led by a spirit also. They're led by the spirit that is talked about in Ephesians chapter 2. The spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So there's a spirit of disobedience and there's a spirit of obedience. Both are trying to lead us, one to God and one away from God. So here, let me read. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Wow. Jesus answered a question in John or in Matthew 22 verses 36 through 39. The question was, what is the greatest and foremost commandment in the law? And I know I know what they were expecting. They were waiting for him to say the wrong thing and they were going to trap him. If he said the Sabbath, then they'll say, "What about love the Lord your God?" Uh, if he said uh, anything else, they would pick the others. But he didn't go to any of the 10 commandments. What he went to was, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. Upon these two things depend the whole law and the prophets. If I understand that right, everything that's written in the law and the prophets are a definition for one four-letter word. Love. Either God or man. And I would challenge you. I would challenge you to find a law anywhere in the Bible, any kind of commandment from God that doesn't have to do either with the way we treat each other or how we view or respect God. Everything in there has to do with one of those two things. Every story, every historical account, Every time a king like Nebuchadnezzar or Belshazzar are mentioned, it has to do with that. Now all of that is given to us as a standard. A standard by which we can measure ourselves. And we can see ourselves the way God has always seen us. You know when, when we come to a realization that from the time 
we become an entity. From the very beginning of life, we're being watched. And every tendency that we have as human beings is being recorded. Everything that we do, everything that we think, every word that we speak, every action that we take is being recorded. And not just as a record, but recorded so that when someone is needed for a specific job, we have that one. You know, Paul made the statement that from his mother's womb, he was set apart. I don't think that means that he was chosen as Saul of Tarsus is going to be this. But the character that was being displayed by that young boy all of his life, every day of his life, everything he did, every word he said, every way he reacted to his parents, everything about that young man was funneling him in the direction of God's use. He was weighed in the balances. And he sure wasn't found wanting. But there's a caveat. God gave him because of character issues that were shown. God gave him thorns in the flesh to keep him from doing what Nebuchadnezzar just did. To keep him from doing what others like Moses, the best man that ever lived beside the Lord. Moses, the very end of his life, had the problem that God wanted Paul to not suffer. Keep him from exalting himself. So that when we are measured... God can say, oh, well done. Come on in here. I want to hear that so bad. I want God to be proud of me. So he doesn't have to threaten me. He doesn't have to tell me he's going to send me to hell. I want to be pleasing to him. I want you to want to be pleasing to him. That's why we look at these these uh, passages like the Beatitudes. We look at Jesus' statements where Jesus will make, I, I really, really want you to start categorizing these in your mind. When Jesus says, unless you, you better put that as right at the top of the list in importance. That better be on your bucket list for change. That better be something that you want to make sure you fit just as soon as you can make it fit. Because if he says, unless you do, you can't, I don't know how you get around that. Because that's what it means when God says, blessed are the... What he's actually saying is, good job, good job. When you have those characteristics. Well what if you don't? What if you don't? I'm not talking about you have to be perfect. But God has to see in us. These tendencies and these characteristics. That we want to make a part of our life. We want that to be us. I'll tell you what. If we focus on those things. Nothing can stop us. Nothing. You look at Nebuchadnezzar. He did a lot of bad things. But just that statement. He raised his eyes toward heaven. And he recognized. He recognized where the power came from. Now we were reading earlier in class. We were reading about the worst king. That God's people ever had in the south. Manasseh. I love that guy. Does that shock you? (laughs) I love Manasseh. Not for the 50 years that he was the most evil. 
but for the last five years when he did everything in his power to turn it around. You talk about a tough job riding that ship. He never did it. But he'll go down as one that tried his level best to do it. Just makes our job so much harder when we spend so much time doing the wrong thing and having to undo everything that we started. So much better when we stay on the right path, when we do the right thing. I want to read from Galatians, finally. Verse 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the whole, oh, hang on a second. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now he's talking about the law of Moses. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are. And he goes down and he lists them. This is a rogues list in anybody's mind. These are the things that nobody wants in a neighbor. Nobody wants to have uh, immorality, impurity, sensuality. I mean, you, you find a, a guy that's involved in child pornography. You want him living next door to you? I... Uh, No, that's the kind of guy you look in the registry and you see where he's living. You move to the other side of town. You don't want that next door to you. Nobody wants that next door to him. It says idolatry, sorcery, enmities. Enmities? That's bickering. That's long-held hatreds. Strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, Man, this is all the stuff that breaks people apart. My, my, <laughs> I didn't wear my Seahawk jersey this morning, but uh, all of you know I'm a Seahawk fan. I'm worried about my team because success is breaking them up. Success is making them haughty. Success is making every man selfish, and I want this, and I want that. and uh, Hope they can get back to being the team that they were. But you don't do that through all of these things that are being... And these are the things that are cropping up here. It says, uh, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. In case I missed anything. Of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Huh, that's interesting. But the fruit of the Spirit is, now this is what you get if you follow God's Spirit. That is love. Okay, that's the number one commandment. Love the Lord your God. Love each other. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And then he makes a statement. He says, against such things there is no law. Nowhere in the world will you ever find a nation where these things are illegal. Not one time in history. Look at any country anywhere in the world at any time in history and you will find that these things have always been the basis upon which a nation is built. That's what everybody wants. What everybody wants from their neighbors. <laughs> You're selfish. I have reasons. You're selfish. Okay. That's the way we generally think. But go back. Go back as far as you want to go in any nation you want to go. And you'll never find a place where these things right here are illegal. And I'm telling you, I know why. Because the God of heaven instilled within that spirit that he put in us, this basic understanding of right and wrong, of good and bad, of what's acceptable and what's not. Now, we, as individuals, we find ways around that. We find ways 
to excuse what we do. And I don't know of anybody that's not guilty of that. Raise your hand if you're not guilty of that. (laughs) Nobody? We all do it. Dan! (laughs) I knew there was somebody. (laughs) Folks, We are being measured. We are being weighed in the balance. Let's not be found wanting. Let's not be found short. I I had a, a whole bunch of ways that I wanted to describe this, and one of the best ways that I thought of was our little granddaughter, Sydney, came up to visit us. And she went up to those rides at Silverwood and she stood there and the thing was up here and she would stand on her tiptoes to try and reach that measurement so she could go on that ride. She even said, can I use Alex's shoes? (laughs) Heels like that. (laughs) No, sweetheart, you can't, you can't. It has to be your measurement, your measurement. Your measurement is what you will be measured by. There's no such thing as congregational salvation. You're not going to be saved because this church was good. You're going to be saved because you measured up to God's standard and you measured so that God's grace would say, I'll I'll cover everything else. Come on in here. Well done. I appreciate your effort. Is that what you want to hear? It's what I want to hear. So if you're subject to the gospel call, you know that you have not been baptized into Christ Jesus. You have not clothed yourselves with Christ. If you know that you have not been born again and received a new start with that spirit that God gave you, won't you come this morning while we stand and sing the song that Mel is going to lead us in? Thank <laughs> you.